Hello, I'm Ken Walsh. This is one in my series of three videos on Old Testament leaders. Today, I'll be discussing Moses, the leader who led the Israelites out of slavery and organized them as a monotheistic people. Moses, along with Abraham and David, shaped the development of Judaism, out of which grew Christianity. Both religions have had a huge influence on Western culture. After a short introduction, I'll summarize the Moses Bible story and provide some commentary for your consideration. A fuller introduction with more presenter information is available on the video about Abraham. This format is a lecture with slides. By way of background, I taught the Old Testament in ancient history for 14 years at a tuition-free Jesuit inner city middle school for boys from low-income families of various religious and non-religious backgrounds. My personal challenge was how to make everyone comfortable in my religion class, how to teach without preaching a particular religious point of view to children who range from evangelicals to non-church Christians, atheists, Buddhists, and Muslims, a real mix reflecting life today. This presentation grew out of my teaching and my recently published book, Bible Stories for All Without the Dogma, a part of cultural literacy. The video and my book are an easy to follow overview of the Bible stories and their times. They are not a scholarly presentation. However, if you are interested in just the basic facts and their context, I hope you will enjoy my work. As I mentioned, the Bible has influenced Western culture in many spheres. In fact, biblical references have often been used by leaders to connect with their audience. Examples include Abraham Lincoln's House Divided speech and his second inaugural address and Martin Luther King's speeches, I've been to the mountaintop and I have a dream. We'll discuss the I've been to the mountaintop speech later in this video. With the story of Moses, we witnessed the exodus of the Israelites from slavery and the developing framework of their monotheistic faith. Let's look at where we are in the span of time. Today, we will focus on a narrow band of human history around 1250 BCE, or about 500 years after Abraham. It is interesting that a 4,000-year Judeo-Christian heritage has had so much influence on people today, people who have been around for more than 3 million years. As we become an increasingly secular society, many do not understand that influence that has crept into our lives. Our story occurs in the ancient Near East. Using this map, we'll begin in the Nile Delta region. You'll find it in the upper left-hand corner where the Nile river divides into branches flowing into the Mediterranean Sea. While Abraham is the patriarch or founder of Judaism, Moses is the key figure in organizing a new faith among the Israelites. His story is told in the book of Exodus, which describes a critical event in the Israelites' history. It is the story of their departure from Egypt, where they had been enslaved for over 400 years, and the story of the covenant between God and the Israelites with the Ten Commandments and other laws. The Israelites will leave Egypt for the promised land in Canaan, which has often been described as the land of milk and honey, despite its semi-dry climate. Next, a little background. Abraham's descendants had settled in Egypt during a time of famine in Canaan, and they prospered. This is told in the wonderful story of Joseph that has become a popular musical, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I invite you to explore it in my book, Bible Stories for All Without the Dogma, or one of the many other Bible story books. Over time, the memory of how Abraham's descendant Joseph saved Egypt from a severe famine had faded. Many years later, a new king came to power who did not know about Joseph. He was concerned about how numerous the Israelites had become. He worried that they might join their enemy if they were attacked. To keep them from becoming even more numerous, the king enslaved the Israelites and assigned them to the hard labor of constructing buildings and working in the fields under the blazing Egyptian sun. This slide represents a painting found in a pyramid's burial chamber. Let's fast forward to Moses as an adult living in the Sinai Peninsula. One day, Moses was tending to his father-in-law's flock of sheep and goats. There, God appeared to him as a burning bush. Strangely, though, the bush never burned up. And what will become many direct contacts between the Israelite God and Moses, God said, I have indeed heard the cry of my people, and 
I see how the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now I am sending you to the king of Egypt so that you might lead my people out of his country. But Moses complained that he is a nobody. How can I go to the king and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God promised to be with Moses and assured him that the Israelites will listen to him and that the Egyptians will respect him. However, Moses whined and asked what he should do if the Israelites doubted him. God gave him three miracles to perform. In one miracle, God had him throw his walking stick on the ground. It turned into a snake. When Moses picked it up, the snake turned into his walking stick. Moses was still nervous and told God not to send him because I'm a poor speaker, slow and hesitant. At this point, God became angry and told him that his brother Aaron will accompany him to see the king and be Moses' speaker. God also told Moses that he would make the king stubborn. The king will several times refuse to free the Israelites. In Egypt, Moses and Aaron told the Israelite leaders what God had told them. Moses showed them the miracles that God had given him. The leaders believed them and bowed down when they heard they would be rescued. Next, Moses and Aaron told the king of Egypt, let my people go so they could hold a three-day festival in a desert to honor their God. The polytheistic king replied, who's your God? Why should I listen to him and let your people go? The king was upset at the prospect of losing his slaves. Who would do the work? The king may have thought that Moses was just trying to get the Israelites out of work. Instead, the king commanded the Egyptian slave drivers to make them work harder. They would then not have time to listen to Moses' pack of lies. The slave drivers beat the Israelites and made them work harder. The Israelite leaders complained to Moses and Aaron that they were making their life worse than it already was. Moses, in turn, complained to God. Why do you mistreat your people? Ever since I went to the king to speak for you, he's treated them cruelly, and you've done nothing to help them. As you will see repeatedly in Bible stories, the Israelites placed their faith in their one God, only to lose it during difficult times. You will also notice how the Israelites describe their superheroes along with their very human traits. In this case, Moses had lacked self-confidence, a problem we all struggle with at times. God told Moses that the Israelites will know that he is their one God when they are set free. Moses informed the Israelites, but they would not listen to him. Their spirit had been broken by their cruel slavery. God then told Moses to inform the king that he must let the Israelites leave his clan. However, Moses again protested to God, even the Israelites will not listen to me, so why should the king? And I'm such a poor speaker. God persisted. First, he will make the king stubborn. He will not listen despite numerous terrible things that will happen. Then God will bring a severe punishment on Egypt and lead the Israelites out of slavery. Now we begin the story of the 10 plagues. God told Moses to meet the king in the morning when he goes down to the Nile. Tell him, the God of the Israelites sent me to tell you to let his people go. Now, your majesty, our God says that you will find out who he is by what he is going to do. Look, I'm going to strike the surface of the water with this stick, and the water will be turned into blood. The fish will die, and the river will stink so much the Egyptians will not be able to drink from it. So Marin, uh, Moses and Aaron confronted the king as instructed. The river turned to blood, the fish died, and the river smelled so bad, no one could drink from it. Just as predicted, the king refused to listen to Moses and Aaron. He returned to his palace. And so we continue with the next eight plagues, all following a similar pattern. Moses asked the king to free the Israelites or the Egyptians will suffer a plague. The king refuses, the Egyptians suffer a massive plague, and the king calls Moses back and offers to free the Israelites, but then has a change of heart. The cycle repeats with another plague. Next, frogs cover the houses of everyone. Then gnats cover the people and animals. Flies descend in mass on everyone. Next, all the Egyptians' animals are killed, but not the Israelites' animals. Open sores called boils appear on all the Egyptians. Hail rains down on the country, causing massive destruction. The country is covered with locusts, destroying the crops. Darkness covers Egypt for three days. Still, the king is stubborn and refuses every request by Moses to free the Israelites. 
Then God says to Moses, I will send only one more punishment on the king of Egypt and his people. After that, he will let you leave. In fact, he will drive all of you out of here. Moses then told the king, God says that about midnight, he will go through Egypt and every firstborn son in Egypt will die. There will be a loud crying all over Egypt, such as there has never been before or ever will be again. However, the king was as stubborn as ever and refused to let the Israelites go. God had given Moses and Aaron instructions for the night of the deaths of the firstborn. Each Israelite family was to prepare a meal on the appointed evening. They were to kill a one-year-old male sheep. With a sprig of mint, they would have put some of the sheep's blood on their doorposts. The meat was to be roasted and eaten with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Such unleavened bread bakes faster. They would eat quickly and be prepared to leave with all they need early in the morning, dressed for travel. This has become known as the Passover celebration when God passed over the homes of the Israelites on the night of the deaths of the firstborn. The blood on the doorpost was a sign for the angel of death to pass over that house. At midnight, the angel of death killed all the firstborn Egyptian sons. A loud cry went up throughout the land as a deep sorrow gripped all. That same night, the king sent for Moses and Aaron and said, get out, you and your Israelites. Leave my country and worship your God as you asked. Take your sheep, goats, and cattle and leave. Also, pray for a blessing for me. And so the Israelites left Egypt where they had lived for about 430 years. Let's take a look at this story. You might wonder, what is the point of the story of the 10 plagues? Perhaps it's another example of testing one's faithfulness. Who would repeatedly risk his life pestering an all-powerful king as Moses did? Next, there is a nature-related explanation for the nine plagues. The first nine plagues describe natural events that have occurred in northeastern Africa, along with contributing strong winds. For example, heavy tropical rainfalls have washed red soil downstream and can create an illusion of a bloody Nile. A resulting higher-than-normal fish killed could cause frogs to seek land. A flood could cause an explosion in gnats, flies, and insects, which could result in pestilence among the animals and infections or boils among the people. In addition, anthrax spawned by the dead fish could kill frogs and spread among the humans, causing boils and related deaths. Furthermore, all this destruction could be picked up as dust by strong winds from the Sahara Desert and leave the days in darkness. The story of the 10 plagues may have also been intended to demonstrate the power of the God of Israel over specific gods of Egypt represented in the plagues. For example, Ganun was a fertility god associated with water, that is the Nile. Imhotep was a god of sacrifice overpowered by the plague of boils. Seth was a god of crops overpowered by the plague of locusts. And Osiris was the god of life overpowered by the death of the firstborn. When the Israelites left Egypt, God did not guide them along the shortest route to Canaan, the coastal highway. God was afraid that the Israelites would change their minds about freedom and return to Egypt when they saw they might have to fight. On the coastal highway, there were several Egyptian forts that had been used in Egypt's military campaigns into Canaan. Furthermore, they were the mighty Philistines just across the border with Egypt. Instead, God sent them along a safer roundabout way through the Sinai Desert toward the Red Sea. During the day, God guided them with a column of cloud. During the night, God guided them with a column of fire. When the king of Egypt learned that the Israelites had actually left, he became upset at the loss of so many slaves. They had contributed greatly to Egypt's rise as a powerful nation by helping to feed the Egyptians and by constructing buildings. He pursued them with his 600 finest chariots and caught up with them as they were camped by the Red Sea. The Israelites were terrified by the sight of 600 horse-drawn chariots racing toward them. They feared being trampled, speared, or axed to death, and they were defenseless. They complained to Moses. They had walked to the desert with little food. They were tired, hungry, and now about to be slaughtered. It would have been better to stay in Egypt, sheltered and fed as slaves, they complained. Moses told his people, don't be afraid, stand your ground. See what God will do to save you. The column of cloud that had guided the Israelites to the shore of the Red Sea 
moved between the Israelites and the approaching Egyptians. As instructed by God, Moses lifted his walking stick over the sea. A strong wind sent by God pushed the water aside and dried the seabed. The Israelites crossed. As the Egyptians pursued them, the wind died. The water rose and the chariots became stuck in the mud. As the water rose further, the Egyptians drowned. When the Israelites saw what had happened, they proclaimed their faith in their one God and in Moses. They believed again. Unfortunately, this is just one of many examples to come of the Israelites losing their faith only to come back to it after a calamity. By the way, the term Red Sea dates to a Greek translation. The earlier Hebrew text notes the Reed Sea. Some scholars believe the crossing occurred in a marshy area near Lake Timsa, located between the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea. Periodic gale force winds from the northeast could dry out the marshes. A shift with more moist winds from the south could restore the marshlands. About 60 days after leaving Egypt, they camped at the foot of Mount Sinai. Three days later, God called Moses to the top of Mount Sinai and told him the Ten Commandments. By way of background, Mount Sinai is an imposing gray and pink granite mass rising 7,500 feet above sea level in the southern Sinai Peninsula. It is often hidden by clouds, and the local people thought of it as a home of their God. Here are the Ten Commandments. Notice the first three commandments relate to God, while the other seven, the majority of the commandments, relate to people. Moses came down from Mount Sinai and shared the Ten Commandments with the Israelites. He reminded them that, they, that there were no gods represented by the gold statues to be worshipped in place of the one God. It was a common practice among the polytheistic people they had lived with in Egypt to worship such an idol. And we suspect that the early Israelites may have practiced rituals from both religious faiths, polytheistic and monotheistic. Days later, God called Moses back up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive two stone tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. Moses stayed there for 40 days and nights. You may have noticed that the number 40 is used in a number of Bible stories. The number 40 was used in a Noah story, which mentioned it rained for 40 days and nights. Moses stayed on Mount Sinai with God for 40 days and nights. The Israelites wandered in the Sinai desert for 40 years due to their unfaithfulness. Jesus fasted for 40 days and nights in the desert. Many biblical scholars view the number 40 as representing a period of testing or purification. The people became restless with Moses gone so long. They told Aaron that they did not know what had happened to Moses, their leader who led them out of slavery. So they asked Aaron to make them a god to lead them. He collected their gold earrings, melted them, poured the gold into a mold, and made a gold bull calf statue. Such statues were commonly worshipped by their neighbors as a symbol of a powerful god, El, who represented virility and strength. When Moses came down the mountain and saw the people worshiping the bull god, he threw the stone tablets down. They broke into many pieces. He melted the gold bull god and took Aaron and the people to task for their lack of faithfulness. Later, God called Moses up to the top of Mount Sinai and wrote his Ten Commandments on a second stone tablet. God made a covenant with Moses to protect the Israelites. God told them to obey his her commandments in exchange. Moses told the people all of God's commands, and they said they will do everything God commands. The Ten Commandments were kept in a special box called the Ark of the Covenant. As the Israelites moved, they carried the Ark of the Covenant with them. When they set up their camp, they kept the Ark in a special tent called the Tabernacle. The Israelites continued to have weak moments of doubting and complaining about Moses, Aaron, God, and their hungry and thirsty plight in the Sinai Desert. As a result of their lack of faith, their entry into the Promised Land of Canaan was repeatedly delayed. The Israelites continued to wander about the desert for 40 years. At Meribah, the Israelites were at wit's end, complaining what a miserable place it was without food or water. God told Moses to gather the Israelites together, take a stick, and speak to the rock over there, and water will gush out of it. Moses, who appeared to be upset with the Israelites, gathered them together and said, Listen, you rebels, do we have to get water out of this rock for you? Instead of talking to the rock as instructed, 
he struck it twice and water poured forth. However, God reprimanded Moses for not having the faith to acknowledge God's role. As a result, God told Moses that he will not lead the Israelites into the promised land. Eventually, the wanderings ended at Mount Pisgah in Moab, east of Jericho. God showed Moses the promised land. Moses died, and Joshua, his trusted follower, became Moses' successor, and he led the Israelites into the promised land. Please notice the similarity with Martin Luther King's I've been to the mountaintop speech that day before his death and see if you think he used this Bible story to make a point at this difficult time in the civil rights era of the late 1960s when he was being challenged by more forceful and less nonviolent elements. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Next, let's talk about the Ten Commandments. In the early cities of Mesopotamia, the functions of government and worship were handled by one person, the priest. By 3000 BCE, the priests began sharing power. It was too much for them to do everything. Eventually, full-time rulers called kings began sharing power with the priests. The kings handled the earthly duties, such as organizing an army, managing irrigation canals, storing surplus grain, and settling disputes. The priests worked to please the gods, who were thought to control everything. Each city had its own god, who was thought to give the kings their power through their priests. About 500 years before Moses, Hammurabi, the Mesopotamian king, created one of the early organized sets of laws called the Code. The Code of Hammurabi was a set of 282 laws that established behavior norms across his empire. This enabled everyone to know what was expected, even if they were not near the king. The Ten Commandments arrived at a time when Moses was leading thousands of Israelites as they evolved into a nation. He was performing the duties of a priest and a king, just as others had done in this area of the world before him. In addition to the Ten Commandments, God gave Moses over 600 laws to help govern the Israelites. Many of them are similar to civil laws today. Example, how to keep the camp clean and people healthy. How to deal with leprosy. How to handle thieves and other kinds of crime. How to handle issues related to marriage and inheritance. In closing, let's look at the significance of the Moses story. We have a striking example of faithfulness to God in approaching the Egyptian king 10 times to request the release of the enslaved Israelites. Moses leads the Israelites out of slavery. Moses and the Israelites make a covenant with God. In exchange for God's protection, the Israelites pledge obedience to the Ten Commandments and God's laws. Lastly, Moses is the first leader of the Israelites as a unified free people. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. If you have questions or comments, please contact me at kenwalsh3 at icloud.com. For more information, please consider my new book, Bible Stories for All Without the Dogma. It is a rare book on just the key stories and their context without religious dogma. The stories also include Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah, Jacob and Esau, Joseph, Joshua, Deborah, Samson, Ruth, Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, and Esther. You're also welcome to follow me on Facebook at Ken Walsh Author. Thank you for your time today.